Welcome back to Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics, and joining me on the show today is Nick Giambruno. He's the chief analyst of the Casey Report and its premium value investing report, Crisis Investing. How are you today, Nick? Oh, I'm doing great. Nice to be with you, Tom. Glad to have you back on the show after a little bit of a hiatus there. Um, I thought, Nick, we could start off by clarifying a definition that I thought you had a good way of really highlighting. And let's define the difference between hard money and easy money and maybe use a couple examples of why, let's say, gold and Bitcoin are good examples of hard money. Sure. I think this is one of the most misunderstood concepts in the precious metals and sound money space. And that is what is a hard asset? What is hard money? And most people think that it just means something that's hard and tangible like metal or real estate or oil. But that, in fact, is not what hard money means. Hard money means and hard asset means simply it's short for hard to produce. That's what it means. It means hard to produce and specifically hard to produce relative to the existing supply. That's what a hard money is or a hard asset is. And when you look at it through that example, you can see which assets are the hardest assets. And this is something you can quantify because it's really, how do you quantify the hardness of an asset is you look at the supply growth rate, which is the rate new supply comes onto the market relative to the existing supply. So Gold, up until recently, has been the hardest asset, the hardest money that it has been known to man. And that is because its supply grows, you know, around like one and a half to two percent per year. And that is a unique, gold has some unique attributes that other metals and other assets don't have. So first, gold is indestructible. Basically, you can't destroy it. And second, it's been, a, the stockpiles, the supply of gold has been accumulating for thousands of years, over 5,000 years. So that has made gold in a unique position where it has a very large stockpile relative to the annual supply growth. And that's what's made gold a very good money because it's not been easy for anybody who has had intentions to inflate the gold supply or make it bigger. It's not very easy to do because it has that large built up stockpile and the current supply growth is very low. And that's what's made gold the best money that mankind has known up until recently. There, it has a, and it now has a competitor. But it's for the same reason that other assets are people that commonly misunderstand as hard assets. Like, for example, platinum and palladium. These are not hard assets by that definition of hard to produce relative to current supplies. That's because, well, platinum and palladium are actually rarer. They're more scarce than gold. Well, I'll get to that in a second. There's a difference between scarcity and hardness. So platinum and palladium are more scarce than gold. However, the annual production is about equal or more to the current stockpiles of platinum and palladium, which makes them more suitable as, and in fact they are, in primarily industrial metals instead of monetary metals. It's because the new supply, the supply demand can change can really rock the market, you know, from year to year. So that's an example of why platinum and palladium are, you know, they're metals, they're precious metals, but they're they're not hard assets by that definition because new supply is completely significant to the existing stockpiles. It's not not true of gold. So that's a misunderstood thing. You know, oil is certainly not a hard asset in that definition. Really, you've got gold, silver, and Bitcoin are the hardest assets that we have right now. And silver isn't even that good either because silver is primarily, it's not totally insignificant. Silver has some monetary use, but it's primarily an industrial metal. And we see that in its hardness too because it's not even close to being the hardness of gold. So you get, for example, the current production of silver is, you know, give or take 30 33 30, 33% of the existing stockpile of silver every year that's coming onto the market. So that doesn't make for a very good hard asset. Nonetheless, it's still better than anything else besides gold and Bitcoin. And Bitcoin, you know, that this also people get confused with this too because they think how can Bitcoin be a hard asset because it's not physical, it's not a piece of metal, it's not real estate, it's not oil. But then again, that shows if people don't understand what the definition of a hard asset or a hard money is. Bitcoin's new supply growth is actually about equal to gold's uh, right now and it's continuously decreasing over time. So that gives it a very unique and ideal monetary property because money, one of the attributes of a good money is that it's a hard asset. 
you know, you want it to be a hard asset because you don't want it to be easy for people to inflate. You don't want it to be easy for people to produce, so they inflate the supply. So a characteristic of a good money is that it's a hard asset. And gold, Bitcoin, and silver are the top three. And I think an important distinction there, Nick, as you say, you're kind of really highlighting the word money there. And money is more of a store of value rather than a currency, which is not, right? Well, this is a, also a thing, too, is that most people haven't thought about what is money or what makes a good money. They kind of just take it for granted that it's something the government gives us. And, you know, I, I liken it to uh, how it was in the Soviet Union. You know, you talk to somebody from the Soviet Union and, you know, they ask them, oh, where does bread come from or where do shoes come <laughs> from? And they would say, oh, it comes from the government. And they just wouldn't put much more thought into what makes a good shoe or what makes a good bread. They just think it's something that the bureaucrats hand out to them. And that same mentality is how most people in the world think about money, certainly in the West. They don't think of what it is. I mean, it's kind of a philosophical abstract question, but really it's not. All money is is something that's good at storing and exchanging value. That's it. That's all money is. Something that's good at storing and exchanging value. So that is how you have to think about money and how you have to think about things that are good at storing and exchanging value. I think another important way to think about this distinction, and actually it's a good transition here, is thinking about the gold and silver price in real terms versus nominal terms. So let's say as we're pricing gold and silver in U.S. dollars, thinking about actually adjusting that chart for inflation rate as well. And I know you recently wrote an article that contained a little bit about that. So could you tell us a little bit about really looking at the difference between the spot price and then adjusting it for inflation as well? Yeah, and that's tricky because how, how do you adjust it for inflation? Because there's a lot of different ways you can do it. I mean, most people use the government's CPI numbers, but those are crooked and obviously cooked to understate inflation. And infl this is another commonly misunderstood <laughs> thing. It shows you how words change over time. Because the proper definition of inflation is an increase in the money supply. It's not an increase in prices. Most people think it's an increase in prices, but that is to obfuscate where the increase in prices is coming from. It's coming from the increase in the money supply. Sounds like a very subtle difference, but this is a very important difference because the inflationists like to hide their crimes, and this is a way they do it with confusing language. And that's the thing, too, is that the dollar or any other of these other fiat currencies they're not good measuring sticks. So we're looking, we're measuring what an ounce of gold is worth in a dollar, which is something that's continuously changing, constantly changing. So it's like trying to measure your shoe size in a size that constantly changes. So it's, it's pretty tricky to do that. You know, I mean, we use dollars. So yeah, you know, it's more important to look at the purchasing power too of it too. And you know, what does an ounce of gold buy you? What does an ounce of silver buy you? And I prefer to look at prices measured in gold because gold is, it's sound money, it's honest money, it's hard money, it's the oldest form of money. So I think you can get a better reflection. Instead of thinking about measuring the dollar or gold in terms of the dollar or inflation adjusted dollars, I would recommend to think of measuring other things in terms of how many ounces or how many grams of gold they are. That is more of an honest measuring stick to measure prices is to do it in gold. Well, that also makes for a really interesting transition here, Nick, because the next question on my list is about the gold to silver ratio. So in a way, we're kind of measuring silver in terms of gold. And typically, we have seen that the politicians decreed, let's say, a 15 to 1 silver to gold ratio. So why do you think that that's, let's say, inaccurate and get your thoughts on what you think the gold to silver ratio can or should be? Sure. There's a number of problems with that. First is that it's a political number. It's just a number that the politicians anywhere pulled out of their butt and said, this is what, you know, it is. It's no different when then, say, the Argentine government trying to fix the peso at four to the dollar. I don't put any faith into these government numbers. I put faith in the market numbers. So I think also one thing, you know, goes back to what we were talking about before is I wouldn't call this. Yeah. And a lot of people hold this 15 to one gold to silver ratio as like sacrosanct that, that it's got to go back to this. I don't think that's the case at all. I think this is a market value that's constantly fluctuating and what it should be. I don't know what it should be. The market will determine what it should be. 
And also, don't think of it as a ratio. Think of it as the price of silver in terms of gold, which is, you know, as we said, real, honest, hard money. So don't think of it as a ratio. Think of it as a price. It's just the price of silver. It's like you don't go into the coffee shop. You don't go to Starbucks and think of the cappuccino to dollars ratio when you buy a cappuccino. You think of that's the price of a cappuccino. So I would suggest that's how you view silver. Don't view it as a ratio. Just view it as a price. It's the price in terms of gold. And what should that price be? Well, it, it should be whatever the market says it should be. So maybe it used to historically be lower, which would mean silver is more valuable. You know, it takes fewer amounts of silver to buy an ounce of gold. But, you know, who knows? That constantly fluctuates. If silver is becoming more of an industrial metal and less of a monetary metal, you could justify having it at a lower price in terms of gold. So I think that's the answer is, you know, you got to let the market determine what it is. And it's certainly not something that's set in stone or etched into the universe that it has to go back to a certain ratio or price. Absolutely. And it's going to be interesting what we can see in this next bull market, what that ratio could get to, considering that we've seen a recent all time high on that ratio. Nick, as we try and get some perspective on where we could see the price of gold and silver accelerate to in this market, you were saying that the setup today is better than in the 70s and 80s. So what kind of factors are creating this tailwind for gold and silver? Oh, geez, there's so many we could talk about. Right now, why I'm interested in gold and silver, I'm not interested in gold because it's used in dentistry or in electronics. I'm not interested in silver because it's used in photography or other industrial applications. I'm interested in them because they are money. They are monetary metals. That's why I'm interested in them. And what makes them even more attractive as monetary assets is when their primary competition, government fiat currencies, are basically committing suicide. So that is what I'm looking for. I mean, you know, the dollar, as all these governments around the world, they've really thrown out any last semblance of any kind of sanity when it comes to these monetary policies and central banks. They're just throwing all that out the window. I mean, it's really crazy. You got to think when people start throwing around trillions, people don't even realize how big a trillion is. If you counted a trillion seconds ago, you know how long that would be? A trillion seconds ago is around 30,000 BC. That's one trillion. That's insane. You know, it's hard to wrap your mind around it. So when they're willy nilly throwing around a trillion here, a trillion there, you are getting into dangerous territory. In other words, they're destroying the fake money, the fiat money. And what that is going to do, and they're doing this in a way that's really, in my opinion, unprecedented. It's much worse than it was in the 70s and the 80s. And that is why the alternative monetary products, gold, silver, Bitcoin, are going to shine even more. So as we were talking about the currency being destroyed, as you're saying, it reminds me of the story of the Hunt brothers trying to protect their wealth by buying lots of silver back in the 70s and 80s. So could you tell us a little bit about that story? Yes, and that gives insight into what is interesting about silver. And like I said before, in terms of having a investing on this monetary theme, you know, there is only one instance where I'm interested in silver because I'm much more interested in gold. Gold is a much better monetary asset than silver. However, there is an issue with gold sometimes. The reason the Hunt brothers saw all the same kind of things I was describing about monetary destruction, inflation, and they were concerned. And this started back in the early 70s when it was illegal for them to buy gold. Gold was still illegal for the average person to buy at the time in the early 70s when they started to get into this market. So they turned to the next best thing and they turned to silver and they quickly accumulated a large position in silver. The price spiked. However, the problem with silver is once the price spikes, you got to get out quickly because once the price spikes, silver is not as hard of an asset as I was talking about before as gold or Bitcoin. What that means is that it's very easy to induce the production of more silver when the price spikes. So when the price spikes, it's going to induce more supply to come on the market and it's going to have just as a violent as a reversal on the way down as it does on the way up. That's exactly what happened with the Hunt brothers and it also happened in 2011. And I think it'll happen again and why it'll happen again is because we got a little bit of a whiff of this earlier this year and currently now with the physical gold market and the shortages in the physical gold market. When this inflation crisis really hits in earnest, people aren't going to be able to buy physical gold. You already see this. I mean, there's delay if you want to buy physical gold. There's ridiculous premiums, ridiculous delays. 
Oh, uh, that's just a little bit of a taste of what's to come. I think the physical gold supply, you won't be able to buy it at any price. It's so small, it'll vanish. So the same kind of dynamic is going to happen with silver. At that point, the average person is going to see inflation, prices increasing. They can't buy gold. I think they'll also buy Bitcoin, too. I think a lot of them will buy Bitcoin, but a lot of them will also buy silver. And silver is a tiny market. That'll cause the price to spike. We've already kind of seen that, but I think it'll spike much more dramatically when this actually happens. But then, you know, like I said, you got to be quick. You got to get out. And it's a tough thing to do when the th it looks like it's going to continue to go up. But it's definitely going to induce the, the production of more silver because silver is an easier money than gold and Bitcoin. And you'll see that when people start to like melt down their relatives, their mother's silverware and jewelry and this <laughs> kind of stuff. That is a sign that new supply is coming on the market and the price is going to collapse. So you have some time, but it usually collapses when the price spikes. So that's how I view silver. You know, it's very speculative. It's very volatile, but the returns can be even bigger than gold. And that's a reason I'm interested in silver. More of a speculative thing, but in terms of monetary prudence and, you know, having an alternative monetary asset, gold is by far superior in my opinion. So Nick, as you're saying that supply will really get ramped up. How long will some of those mines take to come back or not necessarily come back, but really start producing to meet that demand of silver? Well, you know, it's not necessarily the mines. It's scrap silver, scrap silver. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but scrap is not an insignificant source of new supply. I don't know is, is the answer. Nobody knows. You may have a few weeks, you may have a few months, and it's not about the actual mine churning out the output. It's about the market pricing in the mine churning out the additional output. So that's the real question is how fast will the market price the new supply in? And I don't know, but it generally happens pretty quickly. Interesting. Yeah, it seems like there's not very many pure silver plays out there. But like you say, once the market prices that supply coming online, then obviously we're going to see the price collapse. Nick, let's turn a little bit to another thing that people normally say about silver, that it's a great hedge for inflation. Is this still true? And why would that be? Yes, I wouldn't say it's a great hedge against inflation. It's maybe the third best hedge against inflation <laughs> after gold and Bitcoin. Right now, you know, Bitcoin is still proving itself. I view it as an, it's an emerging form of money. But as we stand right now, gold is the best inflation hedge. What I mean by inflation hedge is the proper definition of the term, which means government increasing the money supply and debasing it. That's what inflation is. So how do you protect yourself against that? Well, gold is the best way to do that. Silver is the next best thing if you can't get your hands on physical gold at a reasonable price. But if you're, you want to do an inflation hedge, I would recommend to do gold above all else. Perfect. So if we see a big panic into the precious metals as an inflation hedge, like for gold, silver, Bitcoin, do you have any thoughts towards what we could see that propel the prices for these um, assets to? Well, nobody knows. Again, we do know they're inflating the currency at historical levels, levels never seen before in history. I've said before that I think we're in the early stages of what will be the biggest precious metals bull market in history. So conservatively, you can just take the returns of the biggest previous precious metals bull market and apply that to the price at the start of this bull market. And I haven't run the numbers exactly. I, I wouldn't be surprised if gold hit 10,000. But the returns will be at least as big percentage wise as the previously largest gold bull market, in my opinion. That sure makes a lot of people's eyes light up, I'd say, Nick. But that brings up another topic that I had read on your Twitter there, and it's about wealth taxes. Like one thing you were talking about, about California instituting a new wealth tax, and as well as the other idea of wealth tax by inflating away the value of currency. Yeah, a wealth tax is a terrible thing. And, you know, California is introducing it. I'm here in Argentina. Argentina has a wealth tax. This is a very dangerous thing. It's very dangerous to your personal freedom, your financial freedom. It's a horrible thing. And it shouldn't even be a topic of discussion in a free society. This is a really horrible thing. It's similar. They're saying, oh, only the rich will have to pay a wealth tax. This is exactly how they sold the income tax in the United States back in 1913. Prior to that, there was no income tax. 
not only was there no income tax, it was the same year the United States got their third central bank, which is the Federal Reserve. Not a good year for personal and financial freedom, that 1913. Anyways, prior to 1913, the U.S. didn't have a central bank. It didn't have an income tax. And it did just fine. Not only did it do just fine, it was a fantastic time. They had the Industrial Revolution. The economy was booming. You don't need these things. These are completely unnecessary, not just unnecessary, they're completely destructive things. And a wealth tax takes that to the next level. So what they're saying, oh, it's only for rich people, don't worry, it's not for the average person. That's exactly how they sold the income tax. For example, when the income tax first started, people making up to the equivalent of half a million dollars in today's dollars were taxed only at 1%, 1%. So if your income was up to $500,000, you were only taxed at 1%. The top tax bracket kicked in at about what is equivalent to about $13 million today. And that was only 7%. So that's when the income tax started. And now look at what it is today. It's a monstrosity, a compliance nightmare. You know, you have to document everything. You pay out the nose. It's horrible, terrible, terrible thing. And this is the same kind of thing that's going to happen with a wealth tax. It might start with just the rich people, but once you concede the principle, and it's a principle you shouldn't concede, but once that is conceded, it won't take 100 years like the income tax did to become a monstrosity. It'll happen much quicker, and it'll hurt the average person. This is a very bad sign. It does not bode well for the U.S. that it's considering uh, doing this. I think it's a horrible sign. Seems like the first step down a really bad road. Oh, let me just add, too, a wealth tax. That means your unrealized capital gains will get caught up in this wealth tax. So say you buy a bunch of gold stocks and they shoot to the moon, but you don't sell them. You think you don't have to pay a tax because it's an unrealized gain. Well, you get hit with that wealth tax. Yeah, you're going to pay on everything. Your unrealized stock gains, your unrealized Bitcoin gains, your artwork, or whatever it is. They tabulate everything and you'll pay on that. So it's a really, really horrible thing. And I hope it's not only defeated, but I hope they sow salt into the soil so that it never rises again. <laughs> um, Nick, can you share with us a little bit about another version of a wealth tax, let's say, by using inflation and or negative interest rates? Like, can we make that same kind of comparison? Well, similar. It's not necessarily a wealth tax. Those are a tax on savings. It's a tax on savers. And it's a nasty thing. This is another thing that I, I don't mean to be a stickler on terms, but I don't like the term negative interest rates. And I'll tell you why, because it gives the impression that negative interest rates are a natural market phenomenon. They're not a natural market phenomenon. They've never happened in thousands of years, and they just started happening a few years ago. That's not a coincidence. That's because they're a political phenomenon. They're, they happen because of central bank manipulation of the bond market, of interest rates, and driving them down to such ridiculous levels. And it's such a backwards notion to think that debtors should get paid to go into debt for, I mean, it's completely <laughs> backwards. So it's not really negative interest rates. What they're doing is they're imposing a tax on savers. So I would uh, encourage you and your audience, whenever you hear the term negative interest rates, don't call it negative interest rates. That helps to conceal who is stealing the money from whom you help to conceal the fraud that's going on that is negative interest rates. Really what it is, it's a government imposed tax on saving money. That's what we're talking about here. It's not a natural occurrence in the marketplace like supply and demand determined this in a natural way. It didn't. It happened because of central bank manipulation and because bureaucrats willed it to happen. So yes, it's a huge tax on savers. It's a tax on people not only not getting the market rate of interest on their savings, but they're being penalized for <laughs> savings. It's a horrible thing. These things are causing so much destruction in the economy and in the markets. You can't even wrap your mind around it. But it's another horrible thing that, unfortunately, a lot of people just kind of mindlessly accept as a part of the normal financial landscape. Perfect, Nick. As you were speaking about personal freedom and how the government kind of clamps down on that, can you share with us a little bit about diversifying your political risk by holding your physical medals in different jurisdictions? I know that you guys focus on this a lot as part of the newsletter service. So tell us a little bit about the benefits of that. 
Yeah, well, uh, you know, I work very closely with Doug Casey, and Doug Casey is the original international man. He wrote the book, The International Man, and the idea behind that book is to diversify yourself, not just your gold, but the whole gamut of your money, yourself, and your business. What you want to do is you want to spread that around multiple jurisdictions so that one country or one government is not able to completely twist your arm and force you to do what it wants to do. So it's a very important thing to do in this day and age because the risk that your home government, especially in the West, in Canada, in the U.S., in Europe, they're going to go after you. They're going to go after your wealth. They're going to go after your personal freedom. And if you only have one passport or you have all your business in one country or all your assets in one country, frankly, you're a sitting duck. You're waiting to get slaughtered, not you know necessarily literally, but you're sitting duck for the measures that are coming down, wealth taxes, confiscations. The U.S. government made holding gold illegal for like 40 years from the 1930s to the mid-1970s, like we were talking about before with the Hunt brothers. That's a horrible thing. Imagine some bureaucrat decreeing that it's illegal for you to own a gold coin. I mean, this is really totalitarian level stuff. Unfortunately, I think this kind of stuff is only increasing in the world today, which makes the importance of diversifying not just your wealth, but yourself internationally and among multiple jurisdictions. It's crucially important. And part of that, yes, is holding gold in safe jurisdictions. You know, Switzerland is a good one. Cayman Islands is another good one. Uh, That's a little closer to home for those in North America. There's also Singapore in Asia. There's a lot of different places. But, you know, I, I like Switzerland. Switzerland has been a haven for wealth for a long time, and I think it will continue to do so. But nonetheless, it's good to plant your flags in multiple places. And I know last time you were on the show, Nick, you were saying that Hong Kong was one of your favorites, but that was a long time ago and a lot of things have changed there. So considering all the things that are changing in Hong Kong, would you not recommend that at all anymore? Yeah, it's tricky. I wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket in Hong Kong because Hong Kong is, you know, not this independent jurisdiction. It's basically considerate China. So yeah, that's not as good. Hong Kong has definitely lost some prestige with that. I would consider it to not be an ideal place. I think Switzerland is a better place than some of the other places we talked about as well, Singapore. Hong Kong is good for political diversification because the U.S. government is not on good terms with China. So if you're afraid the U.S. government is going to confiscate your gold or confiscate your money in your bank account, then Hong Kong could make sense because you're diversifying. You know, you got to think of your political risk in terms of how people think about holding different types of asset classes in their portfolio to reduce the overall portfolio's risk. So, you know, like stocks aren't correlated with bonds, which aren't correlated with real estate or metals or whatever. And you want to take that same concept and apply it to politics in political jurisdictions. So you want to have your stuff spread out between political areas that are not correlated. So Hong Kong could play a good role in actually diversifying from the U.S. politically, but it does have that added risk that now it's under the Chinese, you know, mainland China's control. So you have to balance these things out. So I don't think it's completely worthless by any stretch, but it has changed. Excellent, Nick. As we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I think we covered a lot of ground here, Tom. You know, if your listeners are interested, they can check out my Twitter at Nick Giambruno for more of these kinds of insights. And otherwise, they can catch me also on CaseyResearch.com. Excellent. And we'll have both of those links in the show notes. Thanks for your time today, Nick. Sounds great. Thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, 
Hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?